live your life every day. And I pulled out two of the scriptures that I thought were um, pretty interesting. And they have some words in them that sometimes you don't you can't understand. Do y'all ever, when you're reading the Bible or reading a, a Bible story, that sometimes have big words in them you can't really understand what it means? You ever run across that? Never. Never? Never, <laughs> Never ever? You can understand every word that you read. them do some, say some, or laugh at another. They, they knocked her down. She, she was, she was ready to like, that's not good. Well, let me, well, <laughs> these, the kids that are really laughing, who do you think they're really laughing at? Because when we're trying to help somebody, we're doing God's work, right? When we're trying to help someone. And if you're, if somebody's there and they're laughing, they're really laughing at God. Because you're trying to do what God commands us to do is to help others. And when these other mean kids are laughing at us, they're laughing at God. And if they're laughing at God, that's not going to be good. And when you're doing good, that means the scripture says that God will bring you grace. You know what grace means when you, when you do something good? You have the grace of God. It means you have blessings and He protects you and He gives you peace. So that particular was the Lord laughs at those who laugh at him, but he gives grace to those who are not proud. When you do something good for somebody <coughs> and you're helping them, whether somebody's laughing at you or not, you're doing what God wants you to do. So Proverbs is a really good book to sit down and try to, you know, understand. It's got some words in it, just research those words, but it tells you how to live your day from day to day. You want to say a prayer? I'm snickering, I'm snickering in a good way. I had that song in my mind. Riddling forever. Let's not go to Ghostbusters. No, let's not go to Ghostbusters. We're not going to Ghostbusters. No, we're not going to Ghostbusters. 
the Ghostbusters, the little Star Wars but after church, okay? I want you to think of this. Picture it. Close your eyes. Picture this. R2 D2. Okay? Alright? Close your eyes again. Picture this. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for these beautiful children that are here today, God. We thank you for the, the caring and loving and disciplined hearts that bring children into the church, God, for it is the future of the church. And we ask your blessings upon what they hear and God what they speak. And that they'll always remember, God, and do your will, whether people laugh or not. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to 2 James. Actually, just James. I just, I just wanted to see if I could get somebody. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna go to James. Chapter 1 is going to be an easy one to get to. I've got a few other scriptures today, but uh, I want to make sure that everything I say comes from the Word of God. And not from the philosophies of the Because the nation's known by their laws, amen? 
Whether you follow them or not, it doesn't matter. You know, we don't even follow our own Constitution sometimes. The Founding Fathers' point of our Constitution was this. Let's bring God into a country that people can worship the way they want to. And since then, we've been trying to get God out of the country so that we could do what we want to. Does anybody have a problem believing that? Well, we have a problem in churches today where people don't believe that the Ten Commandments still mean anything. <coughs> and then once you're saved, they no longer have a validity in your life. Uh, Ted Turner, how many of y'all know Ted Turner? He, like many people, say that it's outdated. The Ten Commandments are outdated. And that they need to be rewritten. In the Ten Commandments, you're not going to find mercy. In the Ten Commandments, you're not going to find salvation. In the Ten Commandments, you're going to find two things. You're going to find the commands of God and your need for Christ. Okay? Ten Commandments, as many preachers have probably already said amongst these walls and in this church, that they are a mere. You look upon the Ten Commandments and you know then, I'm a sinner and I need Christ. In James chapter 1, verse 22, it says, But be ye doers of the word. I didn't say chapter 22, did I not? Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in the glass. Not a spiritual face. But who he really is without Christ. He beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgiveth what manner of man he was. But whosoever looketh in, into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein is he not he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Notice it says the perfect law of liberty. We're not bound by the law, and we're not under the law. The law is like a tombstone for anyone who tries to live the law. And you are in a grave, and you'll be there. But when you behold the Word of God, and you allow it to show who you really are, when it's a mirror, when it's a glass reflecting who you are, and you see, I need Christ in my life, and even after you're a Christian, when you see the Word of God and the commandments of God, are the commandments of God not the conviction of the Holy Spirit? If you're about to lie, does not the uh, conviction of the Holy Spirit say, Thou shalt not lie? If you're going out on your wife, doesn't the Holy Spirit convict you and say, Thou shalt not commit adultery? The conviction of the Holy Spirit is the commandments of God. It's an understanding and a knowledge of the requirements of God. It's who God is. In Romans 3.20 it says, Therefore by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law, the Ten Commandments, is the start of Christianity. How many can y'all say amen to that? Because it tells us we need Christ. In order to be saved, you've got to confess that you're a sinner, and you won't know you're a sinner until you have the commandments. Paul said, and I'm paraphrasing, I didn't know I was a sinner. I sinned it all until I found out that covetousness was a sin. You know, I preached last week uh, uh, to Shiloh about... The intent of your heart. And I think I've preached on that here before. I'm sure every preacher that's ever been in here has preached on that once or twice. Paul said, you know, I was a blasphemer, but it wasn't my intent. I didn't know any better, so God forgave me. And that's true. That is so true. David said, I want to build the house of God. But God said, it's not for you to build. You're, you're a man of war. He had blood on his hands. He wanted somebody in peace to build his house. He said, but your son, because your intent was good. I'm going to allow your son to build it. Let me tell you something. There's a difference about intent. If you don't know any better, and you intend to do well, and you fail God, you're okay. Did you sin? Yes. But you're okay. But if you know to do better, and you say, but this was my intent, there's a lot of people in hell that continue to say, God understands. God knows I only meant to do this, I only meant to do that, but did you transgress the law of God? It doesn't matter how you feel about the law of God. It doesn't matter the circumstances at the time, whether you're looking in the eyes of a dying child. If you break God's law, you break God's law. Well, it's pretty harsh then, isn't it? It's a pretty one-sided conversation, isn't it? Thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt, and thou shalt not. Does that mean that God is just this dictator of all things? No. 
In Romans 7, 12, it says, So then the law is holy. Is God holy? And the commandment is holy. And righteous. Is God not righteous? And good. How many of y'all know that God is good and been good to you? Amen? Amen. Others say that it's been outdated. And some will pick the ones that they feel are important to them. You know, some people say, wait a minute, now God said thou shalt not kill, but then he requires us to kill, to sacrifice, because sacrifice needs blood. Jesus had to die. He gave his life, but he was still, in essence, killed. Even his own son, did he transgress his own law? No. Is he a hypocrite? No. I want you to imagine something, and I want you to try to understand the importance of the commandments. The commandments were written before the world was formed. Does anybody believe that? If the commandments are God, and they are the word of God, and they are the commands of God, and God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, does that not mean that they are a part of God? That, that who, that's who he is? Where was the first sin committed? In heaven, right? Well, was Satan punished for that sin? God says that uh, until we reach the age of accountability, until we know. That's the whole purpose of the law. You've got to know that you sin. So were the Ten Commandments not there? What's the first commandment? Anybody want to jump up and say? What's the first commandment? Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. What did Satan say? I'm going to take your place. What did a third of the angels say? We want him as our God and not you. Did they break the first commandment? Yes. And you know why they broke it? Because it was there before humanity. It was there before the world was created. God is his law, and the law is God, but God is love. If your son or your daughter was going to go out somewhere, are, are you going to just let them go if you think there's a danger and not say, hey, don't, don't speed, wear your seatbelt, don't do drugs. You're doing that to save their life. The law, though it condemns, is there to save your life. Because us who weren't in the garden and seen the apple being eaten, we're victim to that same sin, are we not? We had to know this. Because I just read the, the verse where it says, no flesh shall be justified whether you know it or not. Somebody says, well, what if there's a kid on an island somewhere and his parents don't know God, they don't want him to know anything about God, and they don't speak of God, and yet he does sin, is he going to go to hell? I don't know, but guess what? It's not for me to know, but I know this. God has made provisions, and that's where faith comes in. God, when he gave you ten commandments, he said, thou shalt not kill, that was his will. That's why every creature, including lions and cheetahs and bears and everyone else, so including humans, were vegetarians. What principle, what's the, was it herbivores? What, what's the technical? Planting herbivores. Yeah, yeah. I knew I'd get that, but I didn't want to make a mistake in, in my pronunciation. You know how bad I have pronunciations. People say, now wait a minute, if we, if we were meant to be uh, vegetarians, we wouldn't have canines. Has anybody ever seen the mouth of a panda? Or one of the big silverbacks, gorillas. You ain't going to find many canines bigger than them, but yet they're vegetarians. Do they have a habit of killing and maybe eating flesh? Yes, but they are vegetarians. They are herbivores or whatever that terminology is. The fact of the matter is that thou shalt not kill. When God created this earth, there was to be no death of any kind for any reason. <clears throat> And if you notice, the first death came by the hand of God when he had to get skins to put over Adam and Eve. There had to be a sacrifice for sin. Did God create Satan? No, he created Lucifer. Did God create angels of obedience? Yes, but are they all obedient? No. Do you think that we're the only ones that are subject to the Ten Commandments? Do you not think that the angels themselves are subject to every Ten Commandment? If it proceeds out of the mouth of God, all beings created by God, all beings are subject. He has inscribed a circle. This is in Job 26. He has inscribed a circle on the surface of the waters at the boundary of light and darkness. How many of y'all have ever seen a, a documentary or anything where a spaceship went in the, into space and you saw that area 
of our atmosphere in space, that line of light and darkness. Have y'all ever seen anything like that? It talks here, thousands of years ago, about that very circle of light and darkness in the water, our ozone layer. Who but God would have known that? And who but the Holy Spirit who, who told men what to write would have known that thousands of years ago, even before they were de debating on whether the earth was round or not? Why? Because God does what he says, and he says what he does. And it doesn't matter how you feel about it. It doesn't matter the circumstance that you're in. In 1 Chronicles, chapter 13, 8 through 11, this is a story where David went to go get the ark. How many of y'all are familiar with that? David made sure of, of a bunch of things. He made sure, one, that the cart that they put the ark in was a brand new cart. He didn't want a used cart that may have had manure in it. He wanted to respect God and get a brand new cart. And I'm sure that the oxen, even though it doesn't say it, was probably the, the choicest oxen that he could find to pull it. And he had a big band and a big parade and a bunch of people and his, and his soldiers dressed up in the, to the hilt and all the, the greatest array. Because he had an intent to praise God with every step as he took that precious ark, the symbol of their covenant with God, back to his city. It says that David with all Israel played before God with all their might. It wasn't no show. They were just going at it. And with singing and harps and psalteries and timbrels and cymbals and trumpets. And they came on the threshing, threshing floor of Chinnam. And Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark and the ox, as, because the oxen stumbled. Oxen stumbled. And anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him because he had put his hand in the ark. And there he died before God. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. David was angry because he went to a lot of trouble to bring that ark back to protect it. To get it out of the hands of, the, of people that didn't respect it and didn't, didn't have a right to it. And here this man, who went with him, and whose intent was to keep the ark from falling on the ground and maybe breaking or being, being defiled in some way. Like our flag in battle, a man who, who jumps up and grabs it before it hits the ground. He wanted to make sure that that symbol of his nation, that the covenant of God, didn't get damaged. And God was angered and smote him for it. Why? Why? His intent was good. He wanted to do something great for God and to protect the ark of God, but it didn't matter because God said, and David says later in 1 Chronicles 15, 2, none ought to carry the ark of God but the Levites. For them have the Lord chosen to carry the ark of God and to minister unto him forever. God said to David, and I'm paraphrasing, look, I don't care how brand new the cart is, I told you that only Levites carry my covenant. And they're to carry that covenant on their shoulders. I don't need a brass band. What did he tell Moses? I don't need a big temple. I just need a place where I can dwell with you. Throw up a tent. And wherever you go, take it with you. Do you take your temple with you everywhere you go today? But he told David. And David knew, as all Israel knew. Only the Levites touch that, and they are the only ones to carry it. I don't care how many bands you got. I don't care how many people are singing. I don't care what kind of music. I don't care if it's a brand new car. I don't care if the oxen are the best chosen. I told you how to do it, and you didn't do what I said. And that's why Uzzah was smoked. So if you think that because somebody loves somebody, that a man can sleep with a man and a woman with a woman and defile the word of God... You're wrong. If you think that because someone is nice and courteous and pleasant that they have a right to transgress the law of God, you're wrong. You've got to come to a decision in your life and one day you might be forced by circumstances or God himself to come to a decision. Am I going to believe and trust in the word of God? One of my closest and dearest friends is a homosexual. And he knows how I stand. <laughs> He knows that I know that he's going to hell. And he knows it. And he keeps trying to talk to me about the Bible and, well, what about this and what about that? 
He said, Is it, wouldn't it be different, though, if a man and a man got married or a woman and a woman got married and they did truly love each other? Because, you know, there are guys that truly love the guys that they marry and, and they don't cheat on one another. Isn't that right? Shall I take you back to the Word of God where it says it's a sin? Shall I take you back to the Word of God that says it's not right? Doesn't matter what the government says. Doesn't matter what your feelings say. It's what God says. God means what He says. And God does what He says. Amen? I've got, I've got a lot of people pondering that. A dying child who asks if I'm dying, when you look them in the eye and say no, and you know they're dying, you've lied to them. God understands a lot of things, but He won't condone anything of sin. There's a lot of people that are going to hell that God truly loves. What did John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God loves everyone that's going to go to hell. For God so loved the world. God doesn't want people to go to hell because the Bible tells us that it's not His will that they should perish, but all should come to eternal life. Amen? We have a way of sacrificing what we know to be true in God's Word to go with how we feel and what's right. People say, well, if God's a God of love, I'm not going to hell. Well, God's a God of love. And if you don't accept the Son, Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, you're going to go to hell. And He's going to love you now, and He's going to love you on your way to hell. And until that breach is closed, the love will always be there. It's not all bad, though, you know. A lot of times preachers get up here and they talk about God says this and you're going to hell for that. And God says this and you better do that. But is it all bad? 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know what that means? That means that when you're truly sorry of your sins and you mean to never do them again and you ask God's forgiveness, you're forgiven. It doesn't matter how you feel. If you feel guilty after you ask forgiveness, that's because you ain't forgive yourself. It's not because God didn't forgive you. It doesn't matter whether you still feel guilty later or not. Why doesn't it matter? Because God said, if you confess, I am faithful. It doesn't matter what you come at me with. If you want to talk about politics or rules or laws or regulations or love, I'm always going to say, but God says. You're going to say, you're right because God says, or you're wrong because God says. You're not going to trick me into believing one thing or another. There is never a time when it's okay to transgress God's laws. And I know that each and every one of you can go home today and you can sit back and you can think. Maybe as early as yesterday or this morning, but there's been a time in your life where you said, I know it's wrong, but God will understand. There's a lot of people in hell thinking that. A lot of people in hell that are going to go there thinking that. What determines the forgiveness and guilt of you is not your feelings. It's the Word of God. Your feelings can't change the Word of God. John 14, 15 says, If you love me, keep my commandments. Effectually, Jesus is saying, If you keep my commandments, you're showing me that you love me. And if you love me, you will keep them. Ineffectually saying, if you don't love me, you're not going to keep them in the first place. If you have a hard time not lying, then you need to think about how you love God. And the love that you have for God. Because it's easy to do what's right where the love is there. Amen? What about where the Bible says that love conquers all fears? How often do we sin because we're afraid to? My wife this very morning said, how do I look in this outfit? Do you not think that I'm afraid to say certain things certain ways? But if I love God enough, I won't be as afraid, and I pray that He'll protect me. Amen? Let me use the ladder again. You believe the ladder was built to get you on the roof? You have faith that it was designed correctly so that you could get on the roof? But you worry so much about its construction and your weight, you don't trust it to get you on the roof. 
All things come in threes for perfect peace. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The body, soul, and the spirit. Belief, faith, and trust. You notice how all these things that bring peace come in threes? And how God makes so many things circular? I won't get too far to that. It doesn't matter how you explain it. It doesn't matter how you condone it. It doesn't matter how you accept it. If it's against God's law, it's a sin. We had a doxology this morning that talked about God's law, did we not? Most of us forgot this. You're going to forget what I've said on your way out of here today. I forgot a lot what I what I typed this morning. That's why I was practicing on the way here. We're human are We weren't. We need, we need Christ. Matthew 5, 17 and 19. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill. When Jesus was at the Mount of Transfiguration, who was with him? Help me. Peter, James, and John. But who, who did they see with Jesus when he transcended? Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah. What does Moses represent? The law. What does Elijah represent? The prophets. And what does he say here? Think not that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. That was Jesus. That transfiguration was Jesus' confirmation that the law of the prophets still live. Amen? For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or one tittle, and, and shall no wise pass from the law till it be fulfilled. If you wake up tomorrow, and you're startled, and you look down, and you're balancing on a, on a, on a piece of earth the size of a basketball, and you look around, and everything else is gone, and you can't see God or heaven or angels, then you can pretty much say, well, I'll do what I want to do now. You won't get very far when you step off that little piece of earth. But Jesus is saying, not until I come again. You can't say what's right. You can't say what's wrong. You don't get to pick the commandments of God. I'm telling you that until I come back and I bring a new heaven and earth, you're to follow every commandment, every law of God. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least of these commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now seriously, how many of you all ever thought to yourselves, I won't commit adultery, I won't have a graven image, but there are times where I lie because I think that God will allow it or I'll I'll do this because I know that God will forgive me later. You know, the first commandment, does anybody want to yell it out again? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. You ever notice how he goes on about uh, no graven image? And how does he describe that? You will not bow or worship any image, any image of anything in heaven and anything in earth or anything in the sea. Notice he said, in heaven. Don't even make something and say, this is God. This is God to me. Don't, don't look upon a picture of a symbol of what we believe Christ might look like and pray to it. It's a sin for you to get on your knees and pray to that picture. Or that one over there. Because we don't know that that's Christ, and it's not Christ standing before us now. It's an image, is it not? Of something from heaven, amen? And God said not to do it. There are times I transgress that law because I'll see the statue of the Mother Mary. And I'll walk by and I'll have reverence for it. That's wrong. It's a sin. Because God said it is. Doesn't matter what the church says. Doesn't matter your reason for doing it. Doesn't matter how it makes you feel. If it's not what God says is right, then it's wrong and it's a sin. And you can be condemned for it. I'm going to close with Isaiah. Correction. I'm going to read Isaiah 25, 1 and close really quick with Deuteronomy. O oh Lord, thou art my God. I will exalt thee. I will praise thy name. For thou hast done wonderful things. Thy counsels of old are faithful and true. And in Deuteronomy 6 And it shall be when the Lord thy God hath brought thee 
came to the land which he swore unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and the houses full of all good things which thou buildest not, and wells digged which thou diggest not, vineyards of olive trees which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware, lest thou forget the Lord, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, and serve him, and shall swear by his name. And ye shall go, not go after any other god. Gods are the gods of the people which are round about you. If you allow people to determine your faith and your trust and your obedience to God, then you're transgressing the law of God. We are no longer subject to die because of the law once we become Christians. But if you're not a Christian, you're going to hell because of the law because it has shown us that we need Christ. Everything else is a decision for you. God is not vengeful. God is not hateful. Now there are times for revenge, but you all know what I mean. He's not hateful. He's not so strict that he doesn't have compassion. He is understanding. But God expects us to obey his law. Doesn't matter what the religion is. It doesn't matter the circumstance. And it doesn't matter the point of interest. You can see a couple that aren't to be together that say, I love you and I love them and I can go out of the world for help anybody. It doesn't matter. You can be a great person, but your actions can still condemn you because they are against the law of God. Does anybody not understand what it means when God says, thou shalt not? Does anybody un not understand what it means when God says, thou shalt? God means exactly what he says. Our Father God, we thank you for the word that you have given us. We thank you, God, for uh, God, the guidance that you give us by your word and your commands, God, your law. We want to thank you, God, for the ability to, to speak uh, your word today, God. I pray that I haven't failed you in, in a way. I pray that we all were able to allow the Holy Spirit to touch our shoulders and to uh, influence our heart with your word today. God, let us remember that, yes, we're going to fail you, we're going to we're going to sin, but to be perfect in your eyes is to never give up on you because you never gave up on us. And to always remember, God, that no matter what, when we know what is right in your eyes, that we need to do what is right in your eyes. And we ask here today, God, for your blessing and your strength to help us to do right and that which is right in your eyes and to do your word and your commands in the following. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. 
why God doesn't want us to worship images of anything in heaven? Because we can have a real thing inside of us. Amen? We have Christ with us. We don't have to look at something that we think might be Christ. when We have the real thing. Uh, I'm going to do a revival next uh, weekend, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday at Shiloh in, uh, in Camden, if anybody's interested in going. Um, and does anybody want to give a closing prayer? Will you? Okay. Amen. Amen.